Cell specialization in a multicellular organism is something that has catapulted more complex creatures such as ourselves up the food web. With cells banding together in large groups in order to survive other more predatory single-celled creatures on Earth, this would allow them to change and later, over time, become more intelligent, and even achieve the capability of leaving the planet they originally formed on. While single-cell organisms still do exist in mass quantities on this planet, arguably the formation of the multicellular being was a huge step for life on this planet, and from what we have seen, the immediate area around our solar system. For multicellular creatures to effectively survive, however, they would need more than to all just be the same cell. If they were all to do the same job at the same time, not only would that just be a massive blob of cells, but the interior of that blob would begin running into issues like nutrition and sustainability. Any single-celled organism that wanted to get in on this multicellular action would run into the issue of, alright, so who gets to be near the surface where the nutrition is, and who has to be at the center where they're very likely going to be choked out by all the other cells around them? Which, as you might have guessed, if it sounds a little unfair to you, well, then single-celled organisms were probably thinking the same thing. There'd be no point in banding together if many of them were just to pretty much be starved out and undergo apoptosis. This issue was the first hurdle for multicellular life. While it wasn't just a bunch of random cells being cobbled together, but instead the daughter cells of a progenitor, the issue would remain the same. Nutrition, metabolism, waste exchange, and then specialization. The last being the key to the success of the more complex creatures. As cells work together to stay alive in harsh environments, Environments, eventually, despite having the same genetic coding as the other cell next to it, some would begin to specialize into slightly different variants in order to provide different functions. This differentiation between daughter cells of the cell that started it all would be extremely important to allow for the host to survive and spread the specific set of genes onto the next generation. Over hundreds of millions of years, new forms would begin popping up, allowing for creatures to exist on land and sea. Skeletal, muscular, nervous, digestive, integumentary, blood, immune, and many others would come together despite being the same cell, and then change to allow the body to become better at survival. We view our bodies probably with some arrogance because humanity's number one, baby, but that ours is something different. While there are creatures stronger than us able to survive in harsher environments than we can, there is one thing that without a doubt is true. We are the most intelligent creature on this planet right now, until all those UFOs that have basically been confirmed at this point by the US government kind of come down and, you know, hang out with us. But seriously though, after you're done watching this, go look that up because it's absolutely wild. Wild. But we view our bodies as the apex of our own evolutionary path. But if you think about it, our bodies are just bone and meat mechs for our nervous system. Every single function our body does is to provide life support for the nervous system inside, which is highly beneficial to our survival, as you might guess, but also in other ways that are not so great. The concept goes back to the blob. The interior of the blob, while the safest, has the most difficulty in delivering nutrients and minerals to the cells that need it. And if it uses oxygen for its metabolism, odds are not a lot of oxygen is going to get there and that's why insects are actually smaller, because they cannot saturate their body properly with oxygen as needed. But then you take things like waste removal, which can be difficult should systems in place fail. On top of this, issues can arise should other cells, say like the immune system, experience an issue and then begin attacking other portions of the body. This dysfunction can actually render the nervous system, which is you, stuck inside of this meat suit, all while the body reports that you are in pain while it does it to itself. So you can kind of maybe see the body, while absolutely beneficial, does have some drawbacks. So so this arrangement isn't perfect. When it works, it's great. When it fails, life becomes filled with hardship as you may struggle to move on your own, experience constant pain within your flesh, whether it be muscular or skeletal, and in general, are just having issues living your life. So the question is, could it have been possible to evolve in a different way? After all, your nervous system is you. And while the other specialized cells are also you, those cells appear to be more just acting in the way as the nervous system wills it. This is the concept of SCP-1027. This creature appears to have taken completely different different route concerning its body, or lack thereof, and gone back to the basics, just itself. This however is not a perfect situation. Whereas our bodies, with the structural supports and contractible muscles, allow us to exist in a variety of environments effectively, it would appear that SCP-1027 is more reliant on its own environment. Albeit it is still able to move on both land and water, the physical support of water itself makes it more capable of movement in there. Item number. SCP-1027 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures 
SCP-1027 is to be housed in a standard liquid containment tank immersed in a saline solution. Personnel are to avoid direct contact with SCP-1027 with the exception of feeding staff. SCP-1027 is to be given one fresh bovine brain per week. All staff involved in the feeding of SCP-1027 are to wear level 4 bioprotective equipment. In the event of exposure to SCP-1027, affected personnel are to be immediately treated as instances of SCP-27 and subjected to standard containment protocols. Description SCP-1027 closely resembles the central nervous system of a human, Homo sapiens, that has adapted to life outside the body. Specimens currently in the possession of the Foundation measure from 1.1 meters, measured from the apex of the cerebrum to the base of the sciatic nerve, to 1.5 meters. Attached are the basic sensory structures associated with human functioning, including sensory nerve structures, eyes, and cochlea. SCP-1027 appears to be able to interpret signals from these systems in the same way a human subject would. However, all neural structures within SCP-1027 1027 are capable of movement to varying extents. This movement is most noticeable while SCP-1027 is immersed in a liquid. SCP-1027 at its core is really just a nervous system. Because of this, electrical signals are conveyed and interpreted likely by the larger instance of neural activity, which would be the brain. The reality of the nervous system of 1027 is much like our own in that it relays signals which can then tell the creature about the world around it. This would suggest that the specialization of cells did happen to some degree, but something along the line went different for this creature as opposed to the normal route, which for any animal, the body formation would follow. However, to understand how it is able to survive in these environments, we must first take a look at the logs and see on a cellular level what changes exist, allowing it to maintain life while appearing severely hindered. Description continued. Neural composition of SCP-1027 appears to be similar to that of a human with the exception of a neural glia. The myelin sheathing covering the cells of SCP-1027 is approximately 300% of the thickness that is found in a healthy adult human. In addition to this, glial coatings of neurons of SCP-1027 have been found to extend the full length of the cells and are apparently permeable to neurotransmitter compounds. As a result, SCP-1027 is capable of supporting itself outside of the environment of a living body, although it is most comfortable in a somewhat saline water solution. The first thing to note about a nervous system is the inability to move, which might be a shocking realization. A neuron inspires movement in the body by sending an electrical charge, which is then carried by each motor neuron and passed to the next. This causes the muscles in the body to contract upon receiving the signal, which then performs the action. For your own information on the lowest base level of this, you have this pathway form in each cell. An electrical signal is detected through the dendritic connections, which attach to the larger cell body section. This signal, if strong enough, is then sent through the axon, but the myelin sheath is also highly important to this whole functioning. It aids in the signal being sent and actually speeds it up, making it very important in how the cell fires. Continuing down the axon, it eventually will hit the synaptic gap. Here is where the neurotransmitters are sent to the next neuron dendritic connection to continue the process. In healthy nervous systems, the myelin sheath speeds up this signal, propelling the signal through the body to roughly about 156 to 270 miles per hour, or 70 to 120 meters per second, and this is why it seems almost instantaneous between thinking and moving. It can be assumed that based on the neural system we see, which is basically 1027 in its entirety, that it would follow a lot of similar aspects to this. The glial coating is actually its own set of specialized cells. Going back to the fact that some of the cells are changed so that 1027 can detect and interact with what's happening in its environment, these cells would form a barrier between the world and the neurons itself. The key to all this is that these cells would need to actually be aiding in the movement. Since the neurons cannot move themselves, the glial coating actually appears to be able to contract, meaning that there are some specialized cells in there that may be linking together to allow it for movement movement, but since it's not as much as say the muscle cells on your body, it has difficulty on land than it would in water. So in our own body, glial cells actually do play a pivotal role in supporting functions of the nervous system. You can almost consider them to be the glue of the nervous system, which is, as you might guess, very important, but they also assist in repair functions and general operation of the nervous system itself. Many cells, such as the astrocytes, are involved in maintaining the right chemical environment to regulate blood flow and enhance oxygen saturation. Microglial cells can help with brain development, but also with the 
the defense of the brain itself by removing debris such as dead cells via phagocytosis. Oligodendrocytes produce the fatty substance for the myelin, which as stated, acts as the protective sheath. Essentially, these cells maintain the nerve cells in areas where the rest of the body may not be able to. Nervous system cells aren't actually in physical contact with one another, just so you know. Instead, they communicate through neurochemicals to the next cell, which gives it the ability to communicate and operate the body. In our body, there are supporting structures that help hold things in place, but with 1027, these are quite absent. So, you can think of the glial cells as almost a form of skin and muscle on the nervous system, keeping everything maintained and also holding the nervous system with 1027 together while it moves through its environment. The thicker myelin sheath can also account for possibly physical trauma resistance. The myelin sheath is actually made out of fatty substances and proteins to protect the axon, which, as you might guess, would be invaluable to 1027, and should the axon become damaged, its entire movement would be compromised. In our own bodies, the meat suit we enjoy protects the nervous system in a lot of ways by putting meat between the outside world and the nerves. 1027 has overcome this issue by having no meat and just really increasing the insulation around the axon to over 300%. Even with the changes to its nervous systems, the issue is, though, the planet itself. Gravity is a tough thing to contend with. In fact, we as a species have bones that prop us up, which can stand up to hundreds of pounds of force before cracking. And this is with most of them. Some of them actually, I think it's like three pounds of pressure in the neck is all it takes to basically snap your spine. But when an animal does not have this, their bodies would quite clearly have issues moving and surviving. The one area, however, that does not have to deal with quite as many constraints as land provides is in the water. 1027 can move on land, but not as effectively. Instead, the physical pressure water gives allows it to move better and at a much better rate than it can on land. And this is because of the actual supporting pressure taking the weight off the body. So imagine like a rolling ball of spaghetti that's on land. In water, it can dangle and expand out much like a jellyfish can, and this allows it to be seen in its normal status. SCP-1027, however, is not above biological functions. Its entire body exists because of certain adaptations it was able to form in response to its environment. But by the very reason it was able to do this, we also see that it requires nutrition like any other animal does. It's not 100% a contained ecosystem of flowing nutrients. Instead, materials are used by the body lost through time, albeit at a much slower rate than our own bodies would demand. Description continued. SCP-1027 seems to feed primarily on neurotransmitters found within the mammalian brain tissue. Consumption takes place by a process similar to osmosis in which the neuroglia of SCP-1027 extract and absorb certain compounds. The exact process by which this is accomplished is unknown. Regular feedings render SCP-1027 more docile, reducing the risk of exposure. However, it would seem that SCP-1027 is capable of survival for extended periods of time without feeding, and it is not known at this time whether there is actually a biological need for these chemicals. It's fairly clear that SCP-1027, at least from my perspective as a biologist, does require the nutrition of others to maintain its own ability. And there are a few context clues as to why this is the case. Taking a look at how it is acting post-feeding to prior feeding would indicate that upon taking in new chemicals, brain functions stabilize. While no organ is reporting hunger through possibly the chemical ghrelin, it could be that neurons are firing less effectively should neurotransmitters begin running low. Things like serotonin and dopamine decreasing would increase aggression in 1027. However, after a feeding has been concluded, these levels return to normal, which allows it to remain docile. As time passes, though, the concept of how it can go weeks without needing to feed again would, to me, be pretty standard. While the nervous system does use more nutrition than other specialized cells in the body, the fact is 1027 is only taking in nutrition for its nervous system and a few specialized cells. The energy demand would be much lower, and it may be possible for 1027 to actually lower its neural activity in order to save the neurotransmitters for longer periods of time, allowing them survive. Our own brains do this with our bodies in terms of shutting off hunger signals in starvation times and also decreasing activity of their bodies in order to conserve energy until food can be found. In my mind, I would also imagine how the glial cells are finding and attacking these neurons explains what happens when humans are attacked. But to explain that, let's first take a look at the final log describing the consumption of neural tissue or the creation of a new 1027. Description continued. When presented with live prey, SCP-1027 will apparently merge with its nervous system, draining the neurotransmitter agents over time, leading ultimately to death. However, when exposed to a living or recently deceased, less than 12 hours prior to exposure, human, SCP-1027 will instead infiltrate the brain through the auditory canal. Upon breaching the meningeal membranes, the neural ganglia of SCP-1027 will release a high dose of apparently modified dopamine compound directly into the brain, in addition to an electrical impulse measuring approximately 1 
150 millivolts. This combination has been shown to initiate basic brain activity in not redacted cases. The nervous system of the subject will begin to modify itself into a new instance of SCP-1027. The neuroglia thickens and the entire central nervous system detaches from the body by accelerated decomposition. To date, no specimen of SCP-1027 has been shown to possess any memories prior to becoming detached and have a functional intelligence level equivalent to that of a lower primate. Concerning animals who are consumed, their brains will be drained. While being a mammal, 1027 does not appear to have the ability nor interest in creating an animal 1027. Because of this, the brain cells likely have 1027 glial cells enter those areas around their own neurons, and then those are broken down, likely near the synaptic gap, to release the neurotransmitters, which are then taken back to 1027. The reality of this would mean that in some ways, 1027 is eating the brain of animals for nutrients, and because this function exists, this would mean that they have a biological need of other animals to survive. This is confirmed by what happens when a human is attacked. Upon entering the brain, possibly cellular markers indicate that this is a primate to 1027, but also the fact that they're able to see and interpret what a human is. This means that likely 1027 was a primate of some sort, likely close to Homo sapiens, possibly further back in our own evolutionary pathway. Because of its proximity to Homo sapiens on this pathway, it is able to interact more effectively with the brain. However, even while it is, it definitely still appears to cannibalize the brain in some respects. Entering the brain, it can bring tissue back to life, bringing into question what we know about the natural cycle of cell death in the brain. Reactivating the brain, the high dose of dopamine and electrical shock would begin causing the brain to work in those that have already perished. This could explain why the intellect is really no higher than that of a primate. For those already living, however, it would mean that the cerebrum is being broken down to a degree, and this would decrease the intelligence more so, showing that the frontal lobe responsible for logical thought is being hit. Upon breaking these connections and consuming cells in specific areas, this leads to the overall intellect of the person to be decreased, which in turn affects memory. The original person will have no knowledge of friends, family, co-workers, or really any events, as the structuring of their brain itself would be changed, meaning memories, which are simply just patterns of neurons firing, are then forever lost. Instead, the lower portions of the brain are more in control, meaning that 1027 cannot be reasoned with, and instead simply wishes to create others like it. It would appear that 1027's real ability comes from its own glial cells. Once these cells come into contact with a human neuron, it would begin altering it based on its own physiology and patterns, or it would just straight destroy it. These glial cells would continue to divide in the brain of the infected person, surrounding neurons and changing how they operate until ultimately a point is reached when the body is shut down but the nervous system remains alive through unknown means. A possibility is these glial cells actually capture oxygen and then transport it to the nerve cell itself, meaning that while the body is breaking down, these are under going the same functions, which it will continue to use as it is now 1027. But the body will begin decomposing as the nervous system continues to undergo these changes, such as glial coating and myelin sheath thickening, until the original person is finally changed to the point that they can leave their bodies. My personal recommendation would be to look into the glial cell as a source of SCP-1027's ability to interact with the human nervous system. My hypothesis is, is that these are mingling with the neurons and changing them, which may also be how 1027 is able to inject neurotransmitters to begin with. It's all predicated on these specific supporting cells, which we have clearly seen can alter the nervous system readily in humans or consume the neurotransmitters in animals to the point of host death.